Good morning. Uh, my name is John Sutherland. I am the Fazenfeld Head of Environmental and Ecological Engineering. And I'm very pleased to welcome you all here to the College of Engineering Distinguished Lecture Panel Discussion. Uh, the topic for this morning is on policies, strategies to protect the public from exposure to chemicals and other waste streams. We are very pleased this morning to have four outstanding panelists, one of whom, in fact, is our distinguished uh, College of Engineering uh, lecturer, uh, Dr. Paul Anastas. So let me tell you a little bit about Paul first, and then I will introduce the other panelists. So Professor Paul Anastas is on the faculty of Yale University. Uh, he has appointments in the Department of Chemistry, the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, and the School of Management. Uh, he is widely known as the father of green chemistry and has published 13 uh, books on sustainable technology. He has experience in business. He's co-founded companies. Um, uh, he's founded uh, NGOs, the Green Chemistry Institute, and he served in government uh, in a number of positions, including uh, uh, in the administrations of the last four U.S. presidents. Uh, he worked in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy in the Clinton and Bush administrations. Mm -hmm and he was the assistant administrator and the chief scientist at the US EPA in the Obama administration. So let's all please welcome Paul. <laughs> Our other panelists, who are also very distinguished, uh, are Otto C. During III, who is a professor, it's Otto, uh, <laughs> professor and public policy specialist on agricultural and environmental issues in the uh, Agricultural Economics Department at Purdue University. Um, he served in the U.S. Department of Agriculture and worked on several farm bills. He's been an advisor to the USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service on conservation programs. Um, he was the economic analysis uh, team leader for the White House's uh, uh, National Hypoxia Assessment for the Gulf of Mexico. Um, he currently serves on the, the EPA Science Advisory Board and chairs the Agricultural <coughs> Science Committee. Um, he's worked on uh, restoring the Mi Mississippi River's water quality, and we all know him as a long-serving director of Purdue's Climate Change Research Center. So let's welcome Otto. Uh, next up, we have uh, Jennifer Freeman. Uh, Dr. Freeman is an associate professor of toxicology in the School of Health Sciences and is a faculty affiliate in environmental and ecological engineering. Uh, she's also a member of the public health graduate program here at Purdue. Uh, she received her doctorate in environmental toxicology and molecular cytogenetics from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Uh, she researches the genetic and epigenetic uh, mechanisms of toxicity of environmental stressors and currently is looking at uh, pesticides, metals, and other uh, 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 contaminants and, and legacy uh, uh, chemicals. She received the Society of Toxicology Colgate Palmolive Award at, for research in 2012 and has received major awards from Purdue for both her teaching and research. She is a Purdue University Teaching Academy Fellow. So let's welcome Jennifer. Last, but uh, certainly not least, is uh, Professor Andrew Welton. Uh, Andrew is, uh, Andy is a, an assistant professor at Purdue, uh, joint appointment in environmental and ecological engineering and uh, civil engineering. He earned uh, civil environmental engineering degrees from Virginia Tech. Uh, he is doing research on plastics technology for, er, for energy and infrastructure systems. He's leading a multi-state research study focused on infrastructure repair technologies and also as a leading a study on drinking water safety in buildings. In 2017, his Purdue team of faculty, students, and staff uh, completed a rapid response NSF-backed study that, worked, um, that looked at worksite and public safety issues associated with CIPP use. In 2014, the governor of West Virginia called upon Andy to help his state recover from a chemical spill that affected uh, a large segment of uh, that state's population. So let's welcome Andy. We have a number of, of uh, three by five cards at your table. 
I, if you have a good question for the panel, please write it down, <coughs> forward it up front. I have several questions to start the uh, day off with, but at some point I would like to transition to these uh, audience suggested questions if possible. So why don't we, why don't we start? Um, question number one for the panel. Um, and, and I did give uh, Nina and Professor Nyes a little bit of a hard time because I think they deliberately dropped in some of these chemical names just to mess me up. So I apologize for mispronouncing some of these. Um, Neonicotinoid uh, insecticides came into widespread use in the 1990s, substituting for organophosphate and carbamate insecticides, which have in turn replaced many persistent halogenated insecticides from the post-World War II era. There is emerging evidence that uh, neonicotinoids are depleting bee populations. Loss of insect pollinators would adversely affect food production, yet use of these insecticides has been a boon to large-scale farming. So the question to the panel is, what strategies should we be pursuing in terms of insect pest management perhaps green chemistry as a suggestion, while protecting beneficial species. And, and maybe we can start with uh, Professor Nash. Oh, I'll, uh, I'll be happy to, but I know that there's a lot of folks with a lot of knowledge. So first of all, thank you, John, for, for having me here. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Uh, I, I guess I'd start at the, at the highest level, because we could ask this question about this particular class of insecticides just as we could ask it about a uh, uh, set of plasticizers, just as we could ask it about a set of dyes. And I think the fundamental point is that what we want to get is function without hazard. You want to get performance without the adverse consequence, right? Now, we talked about the evolution of, you know, the, the organohalogens, the organophosphates, the neonicotinoids, and and what comes next. No one wants to go from the frying pan into the fire. So what the strategy needs to be as we're developing new classes of chemicals is how do you define performance to not just be that narrow functionality of killing all the bugs, right? That would be pretty silly. But rather, how do you get the performance that you need killing the, uh, or eliminating the damage from pests uh, to crop production while not having adverse consequence to, to other, um, other species, the, the ecosystem, et, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of, to be more specific, there are a lot of different strategies that you can use that quite frankly aren't limited to, to chemistry. Uh, the, the, we know, and certainly there's lots of folks in this uh, at Purdue that know all about integrated pest management and different types of, types of strategies. But even when it does come to molecular design of, in, um, of insecticides, you know, how do you identify those, uh, we'll say, physiological pro properties specific to the pest that you need to eliminate that is not shared by other uh, beneficial insects, other, other parts of the ecosystem, so that you can target very specifically those, those processes. Can it be a particular, um, uh, there's a number of different attributes. But the thing is, targeting is, is going to be very important and just coming back to, you need to understand that it's, the job is not narrow function, but just broadly defined performance of function without harm. Jennifer? Yeah, I think it's also important uh, just to chime in that we need to remember to expand the toxicity assessments when we're looking at these different chemicals that we're putting on the market and not only focusing on what the toxicity mechanism we're going after with the insecticides, but also remembering there might be off-target effects or there might be other types of toxicity events that are happening that we might not expect. And we've seen this before in the past with different chemicals that we've put on the market, um, especially for a lot of the chemicals that we're using that are, end up being these endocrine disrupting chemicals, for instance, that end up having harmful adverse health outcomes for us, for humans or other animals once we're, once we're using them. And so I think it's 
we have to just keep remembering that we need to run through a full battery of toxicity assessments when we're creating these new types of chemicals and look beyond just that one specific maybe mechanism of toxicity we're looking for for these insecticides to make sure we're covering the full gamut and protecting our health overall too. Let me broaden this a little bit. Um, the, 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 the questions we're talking about are, uh, I'm not a chemist, um, are relatively narrowly chemical. Uh, but a lot of these questions have much broader impacts. And I think one of the things we really have to do is think what kind of a problem are we really dealing with? Uh, are we dealing what some people term a, a tame problem that is subject to the scientific method? Or are we dealing with what the business literature started calling a wicked problem, which involves human values and the political system's decisions? Uh, in a wicked problem, people can't even agree exactly on the problem. They don't tend to agree on the way you deal with the problem. Um, experts are not listened to because this is a value judgment. Uh, and if you just want to, putting a man on the moon is a tame problem. You get enough Purdue engineers and astronauts and enough money and you can do it. The goal is clear, the process is clear, the problem is clear. <clears throat> Healthcare is a wicked problem. And they're very, very different kinds of problems and you've got to tackle them very, very differently. Um, I'd go back to DDT. Um, there is an interesting discussion going on now as to whether we should, in essence, relicense DDT for certain places in the world where malaria is endemic, and if used carefully, we're going to save a lot more lives getting rid of the malarial mosquitoes inexpensively and relatively easily, and are you willing to take the collateral damage? Uh, these kinds of questions, you know, come on you before you even realize it. I'll stop there having muddied the water. <laughs> so, so I'm a civil environmental engineer, and the only thing I know about bees is that they sting me. Um, so I, I'll, I'm going to kind of segue into infrastructure and then come back uh, to reinforce something that Professor Anastas said. But I think one of the issues, and, and to bring up what Otto said as well, it, you know, we're facing wicked problems across many issues. If, if, if we could just do the science and the engineering, and money was an option, and politics weren't an option, and emotions weren't an option, I think we could solve a lot of things pretty rapidly. Um, but that's not how the world works. And so um, across many sectors, whether it be in, in agriculture, for pest control, or um, other, like infrastructure, um, toxicity is extremely important, but also historically has been narrow focused until recently um, where they're trying to kind of figure out which products may be potentially hazardous later on and they'll have to pull it off the market and there'll be a whole bunch of development money that's lost. Um, going back to what, what Professor Anastas said, we want products that have great function and no hazard, right? We, we don't want to know we're, that we're using a product now that in 20, 30, 40 years will wipe out certain populations of really important species or will cause the applicators long-term health impacts. Or in, in case of infrastructure, you know, for asbestos, it was used in mine for years and uh, as the toxicology data kind of started to bubble up, it was still used uh, in, in mine for years. And you can go on TV now and see the consequences of that with these lawsuits and mesothelioma uh, outbreaks. Um, disease um, fatalities. So I think um, whether it's infrastructure or, or um, uh, pest control, um, what I really am, am amazed about is that it's bubbling up to the surface. I think some of the work that Dr. Nastas has done and, and Dr. Freeman and, and Otto have done needs to transition to the infrastructure realm because in the engineering community and civil and environmental engineering, Historically, that's not been there. It's does it have a function? Does it stand up? Does it stand up for a long time? If so, then we're good. Um, so I think hoping that the science community can help permeate into the infrastructure world. 
Could I just add one more yeah, point? Be, because I, the, uh, I am in complete agreement with my, uh, with my fellow panelists, and I just uh, want to add one thing about um, the DDT point, yeah. which, is, uh, which is such an important point because we do hear this being raised. And one of the things you'll hear is, whether it's with DDT or, or other types of uh, hazardous substances, is, well, you know, it, it has this function, and so we need, to, we need to use it, and almost as if, well, we wouldn't be using it if there were anything else available. Let's just be clear. There's, give or take, 100,000 chemicals in commerce today. That's the rough number that's thrown around, uh, give or take. If you look at the number of potential, th so there's about 75 million chemicals that are on the chemical abstracts registry, known chemicals, okay. 75 million. Okay. If you look at the potential theoretical chemicals that will be made, that can be made with a, um, with a molecular weight of 1,000 or less, the best estimates, done by Barry Sharpless, who won the Nobel Prize a few years ago, is 10 to the 63rd. I'm told that's about the number of water molecules in the Pacific Ocean. So have we even scratched the surface of chemical space? No. So before we go saying, oh, well, it's just except, I think there's a whole lot more work to be done in exploring the, the molecular space that's possible and, and getting the kind of functionality that we need without all of the harm. So Andy, you brought up infrastructure. So let's talk about uh, an issue that's near and dear to your heart. Uh, Cured in Place Pipe, CIPP, um, has emerged as a technology of choice uh, for rehabilitating underground water and, and sewer piping. Uh, this technique avoids intrusive excavation and reduces costs. As you know, Andy's research team has, has shown that the steam emissions actually contain <coughs> toxic chemicals such as styrene and other compounds. So the question to the panel is, do we have some suggestions on how we achieve the convenience, uh, economic and engineering benefits of CIPP, uh, but also uh, improve uh, or actually protect the human health and, and the environment? So why don't we start with Andy and get his thoughts. So <coughs> Professor Anastas said something that I hear from engineers and municipalities worldwide. Well, if there was something better, we would use it. But there isn't. So that's the best we have. And the function of the technology is basically to take a, basically a T-shirt that you saturate with resin that you would normally handle inside a fume hood and inside a building and you drag that into a sewer pipe and you blow steam in it and white stuff comes out at the other end and sometimes can go up into buildings, hospitals, daycare centers, elementary schools and uh, residences, uh, or you put hot water in it and emissions come out or you put uh, UV light, but you have to blow air through that and emissions come out. And so the process is really an amazing technology about creating a new plastic pipe inside an existing damaged pipe. I mean, we've been doing this for years, creating stuff inside manufacturing facilities, but now the manufacturing facilities are going to neighborhoods without fume hoods, without certain PPE. And so the principles of green chemistry here don't seem to have been considered in the application of the technology. And that's resulted in children becoming sick, people needing oxygen in their homes, and states and, and worker safety agencies now paying attention. Um, and and um, worker safety agencies and states didn't know about this because they're new technologies. And so unless somebody tells them and makes them aware of it, they're not there. As I um, stop talking, uh, let me just mention that the only reason why we at Purdue were able to do what we did and determine that the emissions were not steam, as assumed for 30 years, was because we worked with toxicologists, we worked with air quality engineers, we worked with uh, civil engineers and worked with material scientists that actually make this stuff. And um, that interdisciplinary approach is really important. Uh, and I think we need to kind of commoditize that approach for all of these wicked and, and non wicked problems moving forward. I guess the only thing that I'd, uh, I'd add, again, in complete agreement with Andy, that there will be many uh, material solutions for how you patch pipes and things like that. 
that's that's really uh, probably not the biggest the biggest issue. Um, so when <laughs> when one of our pipes gets punctured, you know, how do, how do we deal with it? You know, the 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 whole area of self healing materials is going to be tremendously important. Um, personally, I'd like to see them developed so that the self-healing, whether it's in roads and bridges, uh, part of the, the healing, part of the clot that's formed would be uh, from, from carbonates. Um, that would be wonderful. And, and there's good work being done on that that quite frankly needs to be funded at a much higher level, that aside. But uh, the real point that I just uh, wanted to make is around awareness. So uh, I, I've mentioned a little bit about uh, ubiquitous integrated sensors and being able to to hear uh, uh, about uh, and, and, and see and sense uh, whether it's emissions coming uh, out, of a, a pipe, uh, out of a pipe or the various air quality issues, we're moving into a time where this kind of awareness of not only our environment, but a pipe sensing when it's ruptured and, uh, and when it's broken and, and having reactions in real time is going to be uh, all around us. Uh, so. How do we uh, make decisions? How do we put in place processes with this level of awareness of, yes, what we're being exposed to, but also what's going on with our infrastructure? And, and, uh, that's, that's a new time, it's a new, it's a new set of questions, but I think it's huge opportunities as well. Jennifer? I think there's a, a great need for the communication, just uh, kind of what you're mirroring before. In the, I mean, the area of, of public health, we're always dealing with this issue of how do we get our message out to the public about these different health issues that arise, whether they're at your workplace or if they're in the environment from your everyday exposures. And it's really difficult. And I think it also kind of goes back to the point that was made earlier about who does the public decide to believe. And I think it's really important for all of us as, as scientists and experts in this field that we need to be aware of how we're communi communicating this message to the public and making sure that it's, we're putting it in language that people can understand and that hopefully we're being approachable in these types of questions just to make sure that this communication is out there and helping to raise the awareness too. The other thing here is we're also having the problem of determining when is a problem a problem. Um, I had come on my email this morning a new study from the U.S. Geological Survey uh, on our bee chemical, okay, uh, trying to determine uh, how persistent the chemical is in the ground and moving through the water course in the ground and potentially being taken up by adjoining plants. This is a systemic chemical, so when the insect lands or, or eats the leaf of the plant, uh, that's when it, uh, when the insect may be killed or damaged. Uh, and we're still not 100% sure on this thing. And, you know, when does the, this communication thing, when does the public decide a problem is a problem? And are they really identifying a real problem that has scientific merit? Or do we have a lot of emotion involved? Um, bees are now seen as being cute and fuzzy rather than stinging you, okay? He has had one experience and has one v view of bees. I view bees as cute and fuzzy. Uh, and we will approach this problem differently in terms of whether it is a problem depending upon how we view the poor bee who is in the middle of this argument without much of a voice. You know, I, I just want to add one thing, John, because uh, I, I think the point you made is, is so important. They, uh, when we're talking about um, the data that we have and how we communicate that, and I'm guessing that everybody um, gets a sense that, so data is not information. Right? Data needs to be transformed into information. Information needs to be transformed into knowledge. And, Ideally, knowledge into wisdom, right? But those things, but data is not wisdom, and that that transformation process is, is becoming critically important now, since we are swimming and perhaps drowning in data slash information, uh, right? So uh, some of what we are drowning in on the internet, uh, uh, we are not. There's not evidence to suggest that we're very good at curating. Um, 
this information to be able to tell what's uh, true or untrue, valuable, uh, invaluable. So your point about uh, communication is so important, and of course, a critical part of that communication is is curating and being able to show that that judgment and insight on uh, on the value of data. I don't know that we've shown that yet. I don't know. So here I am espousing the the opportunity and the potential of more and more awareness coming in, but it doesn't have to be all good. It's uh, it's something that is is only going to be as good as we are, are at um, uh, in, inflicting that that judgment, curation, and wisdom upon it. So. I have a question from the audience. I have several questions, but I, I will uh, use this to inspire a question. Paul, you were just talking about self-healing plastics, and there is a great deal of discussion about plastics and composites for the reasons that uh, they're lighter very often than alternatives. Um, yesterday you talked about biodegradable plastics. Are there some things that we should be thinking about in terms of pitfalls to avoid um, as we move forward? And maybe in terms of not only research, but you know some perhaps some uh, wise policy steps that we should be taking uh, uh, as, as we move forward. There's a, a, a range of things and questions that need to be asked, even the, the ones that are you know, put out in the 12 principles of green chemistry and green engineering. Uh, and, and so those are uh, fundamental design questions. The important thing to always think about is coming back to, yes, yeah, something can a accomplish a narrow goal, and if you, if you stop there and don't think about the unintended consequences, then you're going to you know, keep on progressing on the trajectory that we're on. Uh, so uh, reductionism, you know, holding all things constant and moving one parameter, <coughs> has transformed our understanding of the universe. It has been completely revolutionized uh, our modern life, and it also has been largely responsible for so many of our unintended consequences. Because quite frankly, the real world doesn't hold all other parameters constant <laughs> while you <laughs> while you change one. Uh, th these are systems nested in systems. So are there are there questions and, and levels of awareness that we have to uh, do when we uh, invent the the next generation of um, self-healing polymers or you know um, you know jet pla packs or whatever it is? Absolutely. And, and if we if we don't ask those questions, if we don't build that into our design frameworks, then um, uh, sadly, we're going to stay on this trajectory, I'd suggest. Otto, I, I guess one of the questions that relates to plastics is the use of petroleum as a, a source for, uh, so perhaps you have some, some thoughts along uh, those lines? Or? The, the, the big debate uh, within the agricultural and food community has been um, um, materials uh, or fuels from, from biomass materials. Um, this is an older debate than you realize. Uh, when I first started at Purdue, uh, at the time of the first Arab oil embargo, which uh, none of the rest of you in the room are old enough to remember, <laughs> uh, uh, there was a, a big push in agriculture that every farmer would make um, his or her own ethanol and run the farm on ethanol. And there were salesmen running around uh, Tippecanoe County and for $10,000 they would drop a still at your back door and you could make ethanol. And uh, uh, I got involved in the economics of this, which was absolutely terrible, along with a wonderful agricultural and biological engineer by the name of Bruce McKenzie who would point out if you're going to make ethanol, stop. you're going to have to stop managing a farm and become a junior chemical engineer if you're going to do it at all decently. Uh, the, the big push more recently has been food or fuel, but there's, a, there's sort of a whole array of things that cascade from this. One of them, for example, being soil erosion. If you're going to use the corn stalks and leaves to make biomass from that organic material, you remove this from the soil and you leave the soil open and much more subject to soil erosion. What's the trade-off? You are not returning the organic matter from this corn stalks and corn leaves to the soil. 
so your soil may start losing organic matter. Even the technical reductionist trade-offs cascade and become almost infinite. And then how do you put that in the context of a wicked problem where people know darn well there are people starving in the world and there's no way we should make fuel out of corn. And you know, it's infinite in terms if you want to cascade a problem like this, which makes life easy for all of us. <laughs> Jennifer, have you uh, been exposed to, are you familiar with some of the toxicology issues? Have you seen some of those in your work uh, for plastics or composites? Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a wide array. A lot of these plasticizers, I think BPA, bisphenol A was the one that made the notoriety out there with the public when they gained on that and being able, and it's interesting, that story, I think, of BPA as of which chemicals the public picks up on and, and decides to kind of be behind and move forward with. And the BPA story, if you're not familiar with it, it was really led by young moms who were, um, whose children were using baby bottles that had BPA in it and when the studies came out showing that BPA was a potential endocrine <coughs> disruptor and the worry was once you heated up the plastics that the, the BPA would leach out into the, into the formula um, or the milk if you're heating up breast milk and having that concern and so it's interesting where here we have the public really behind this push where we haven't had the ban but now we have alternatives coming into, which kind of brings us back to that green chemistry part of it, of what do we replace it with? And how do we go about making smart decisions about our alternatives that we're putting into place? And the alternatives that have been put into place for BPA, now we have these same toxicity studies going on, and they're showing very similar types of endocrine disrupting effects going on as BPA did. And so, unfortunately, that's, we have a number of those examples throughout history where we seem to make these quick decisions, not necessarily intelligent or educated decisions about where we come up with these alternatives, and I think it, it's important. And the basics of it, of trying to come into, of trying to create these chemicals that are safer for us, and the full understanding and the, the full gamut of the understanding of what their toxicity is for us, too. Important. How do we begin to um, infuse or popularize or start getting people to think more about green chemistry, green engineering, designing something from the outset to be environmentally friendly. How do we make that happen? When I was a little, little young boy, my dad used to say to me, I always speak the language of the tribe you're talking to. And what he meant by that, and what I've found that he's meant by that, he, 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 you know, dear old dad, God bless him, he, he's, uh, he, he's gone now, but, you know, he becomes more and more right every year older I get. Uh, and what I, what I realized what he, what he meant was that, um, you know, if, you, if you're trying to persuade a, a board of directors um, who's in business to make money, you, you don't uh, go up, up here, uh, appealing to their moral and ethical, uh, you know, values. If you if you're talking to the to the clergy, you don't tell them how they're going to make a whole lot more money. Uh, if you if you're talking to a, a person that uh, wants to save the earth, you don't necessarily uh, tell them why this is a wonderful academic scientific challenge. Uh, in other words, you put things in terms that people can understand what they're motivated by, and and most consumers are, are motivated by the performance that they want things to to do. So you want to. You want to wow them with this is just plain better. Um, so if this is uh, uh, if this is a car, oh yeah, you make a Tesla. That's what you do <laughs> because it's just plain better. Um, it, you, uh, I owned a Prius. How many people own a Prius? You're lucky if you don't. I'm sorry, but I, I don't. Oh, smart, <laughs> smart. I'm sorry, but it, that is that is not going to be the now. I, I'm uh, fortunate enough to own a Tesla, and oh my goodness, I would never own anything else. Yeah, it's eco-friendly. Yeah, but I'll tell you, this thing rocks the street. Okay, uh, you can go right on through virtually anything. That organic food, it just tastes better. Oh yeah, it's healthy and it's not uh, uh, not n not killing the earth. So I think you have to lead with with that. I think you have to lead with just plain better. Uh, 
uh, now, don't get me wrong. I'm actually sad that you have to do that. I'm actually sad that, you know, you can't go into a boardroom, generally speaking, and say, this is the right thing to do. But I, I guess uh, if I had only one strategy, I'd say, you know, appeal to the, um, to the whiz bang and amaze people by uh, making sure things uh, uh, just work better. And, and quite frankly, we talk about, well, what we need is behavioral change. We need to change the way consumers behave. All right, I, I'm a beakers and flask guy. I know how to make a lot of molecules. I know how to do a lot of things. I do not know how to change the, the, the consumer behavior of, uh, of, of folks. Um, so I've been one that said, how about this? How about we just make the material infrastructure of our whole economy you know, benign and healthful for, for people, and we won't tell them. It'll just be better. How about that? You know, so that's uh, my strategy for what it's worth. Andy. <laughs> when Paul was talking, I thought he was going to go one way, and, and I'll just go that way. Liability determines, legal liability in, uh, determines a lot of what corporations and even politicians do. Uh, in terms of what I've seen in my experiences. And so talking to uh, an organization that a person in their home um, who has a, a, a newborn baby has been affected doesn't cause that company to go in and give them money and take the child to the hospital. It, it causes them to back off and, and shelter in place um, and wait for everything to kind of die down, um, at least in my experiences. And that's primarily because I think um, they were not aware that their technology that they're using could do that or could cause certain consequences uh, to the degree that they've seen. And so um, liability from a corporation standpoint, I think the more that um, it is not good business practice to, to, to operate that way, um, you may see cultural changes in the business sector. There are certainly some good actors out there. Um, that are trying to do the right things, that are, that are um, anticipating and, and making changes without having uh, legal actions taken against them. Um, but there, um, once you have a technology that's out there that's a commodity, um, there's a lot of money into keeping everything in the same way, keeping moving. The other side is the people aspect of this, and how do you get people to embrace or, or kind of facilitate substitutions, alternatives, better, safer, uh, inherently benign technologies, and that's what we've focused on uh, with my group and, and uh, team. We've been interacting with homeowners, we've been interacting with Department of Health, we've been at NIOSH, OSHA, um, to try to get the kind of the, the pendulum to slide towards more public health protection, which then industry would have to respond to if they want to uh, stay in business and make money, um, which they can do, it's just going to cost them more. Uh, and anything that affects the bottom line cost, we've seen from some um, organizations, uh, causes them to go out and hire people to issue disinformation and try to corrupt that whole public information uh, campaign. So uh, there's a lot of play. And uh, if, if corporations did the right thing, if politicians did the right thing, there was no money involved, there was no emotion involved, I think uh, everything would be great. But that's not the world we live in. So we had to find ways to, to come together, to work together. And you all are going to be the ones that make that change. Uh, uh, if I could, uh, I don't. Yeah. No, go ahead. No, uh, uh, just one uh, very quick thing, because I, I think that the, the points Andy makes is imp are important. Uh, when I spent a lot of time at the Environmental Protection Agency, and when you take a look at the, uh, the entire arc of environmental regulatory enforcement, I would be really hard pressed to find many, mm. maybe uh, any, uh, uh, maybe a handful, of any actions that had been taken to enforce any fines that had been levied that rise to the level of beyond the cost of doing business. The, the harm done versus the fines that are levied are in the margins. So this idea that there is just widespread draconian uh, regulatory uh, en enforcement, the enforcement office 
has been reduced to the level where if it tried to inspect all of the facilities that it is responsible for inspecting, it would take centuries at the current rate. It's not happening. So if we, if we think that there's this image out there that there are you know, jackbooted EPA thugs that are going into every plant and we are finding them and we're shutting them down, and we, that, is, that is so divorced from reality that the, um, I, I think it's important that um, through you know, tort liability and things like that that those things exist. But right now, our regulatory enforcement infrastructure, the floor that has supposed to be there since 1970, I'm going to suggest is not what it needs to be in order to just have that minimum floor. And this is coming from a person who always thought and still believes that the best of environmental protection comes from innovation. But you do need that regulatory floor, in my opinion. Yeah, you, you do need a, a two by four as well as a carrot. Uh, <laughs> and, and the two by four need to be effective need not be able to cover absolutely everyone. Uh, as long as you can have enough cases, uh, and the best example of this is the IRS and income tax enforcement, uh, which has also gone downhill, and I'm, I'm sure that tempts more people to, to disobey the thing. If you talk about uh, enforcement on the one side, the other thing that really discourages me from my much more limited experience with EPA is the, in essence, uh, defunding of the EPA labs. Um, the EPA labs were initially for many years, for decades, considered the sort of gold standard uh, of environmental toxicology, chemistry, whatever else, uh, and they have been over many administrations, including the Democratic ones as well as Republican ones defunded. And, and the real thing there is, is what is scientific truth and how do you establish trust in that scientific truth? And if you don't have trust, um, it doesn't work, <laughs> just plain and simple. And let me just add, um, as a researcher, not paid by a company or financial interest, you know, you, your, your, your duty is to the public if you're paid by federal tax dollars, state tax dollars. Uh, and if you come upon something w that is a public health issue or a potential public health issue, it's your duty and ethical obligation to say something about it. Now, generally, you don't, it's, it's not like you discovered something uh, major and it's definitive. I mean, it may be one study you do that leads to other people to get in that space. But um, when you start having financial interest of, of other organizations in play, some of you may not know this, when they give you contracts, it says thou shall not disclose any information until our basically executives review it, and then we will provide edits, and that edits will then be integrated into the report that then you make public. And so there are these other issues that a lot of people don't know about, that when they hear information coming from certain organizations, they assume that, well, because the person or group that conducted it is this, therefore it's at this level of transparency. And, and so I think that's an educational aspect we have to do with this public outreach. We need to make people more aware of, certainly they know they can get a lot of information. We need to make them more aware of what types of information may be generated by, under what conditions, and then let them make the decision best for their family and friends about what to do moving forward. We have a few minutes left, and I, I didn't want to, uh, I had a few questions here, but I thought there might have been some other ones that came up. Are there any questions from the audience uh, before we run out of time? Yes. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I understand you're talking about, like, you talk about you know, how there's this problem with the environment, and we want to introduce some kind of regulation to make it better. Um, but with issues like climate change, mm -hmm. where it have become more of a, in the public, it's more of a political aspect. Like if you're with one party, you side one way, and if you're with another party, you side the other. How do you kind of go about separating the scientific issue from, it's like a little, it's like a place in the The answer is, 
I don't know. <laughs> and I'm former uh, director of the Climate Center here at Purdue. And, and the other one is, I'm not sure you can separate these things out in, in, a, very clean, in a very clean way. Um, I'm not an atmospheric science person, okay? Uh, I'm an economist. I got hauled into climate uh, stuff by a colleague at Indiana University three decades ago, and that's how I started getting involved. Um, I do not really know climate science. Uh, as, as I look at the way climate scientists work, um, uh, and um, that, in essence, began to give me confidence that there was a high degree of truth in what they were talking about. Um, the basic physics of the greenhouse effect is fairly clear and fairly provable. Um, alternative explanations like increased activity of the sun have been proven to be not true. Um, to some extent, you have to take these things, again, I go back to the word on trust in a community uh, and faith. Um, how you, how you <coughs> convince a, the public generally that this is important enough is really difficult. And one of the things that makes this one of the most wicked problems is when we talk about uh, trying to deal with and maybe mitigate climate change, we are talking about intergenerational transfer. And what I mean by that, things that I am willing to do today that may cost me some money, all right, or some inconvenience, and the only beneficiary, or the first real beneficiary will probably be my great and great grandchildren, okay? Am I willing to do this in the sense of looking forward to the future. And in essence, what you're talking about is the willingness of a society to give something up now for a benefit that we're not 100% sure of. I'm only 98% sure of it, <laughs> OK, uh, at, at some future date. And this is an incredibly difficult thing to, to bring about in a, in a society. Um, and if you, if anyone knows how to do it, let me know. <laughs> I do, um, and have spent a lot of time on the climate science issue. And I'll ask the question, you, you say it's a politicized issue. Why isn't uh, astronomy politicized? Why aren't there pitch battles around astronomy? Why aren't there pitch battles around um, geology, most geology? Why aren't there pitch battles? Because there's not winners and losers. There's winners and losers economically, politically, and, and, and so it's not that the science is politicized. The science is being used as a tool in a political battle because there are winners and losers, right? And so when you're drawing a, a, a scientific conclusion, if you have a stream of evidence that leads you in a, in a particular way, and the weight of evidence of that of that conclusion, um, the weight of evidence is overwhelming, you say, that's a pretty strong argument that something is, is happening. That, okay, CO2 levels go up and it gets warmer, and et, et cetera. If you have many, many different threads, different lines of argument that all line up in the same direction, whether it's habitat change, acidification of the oceans, all of them pointing in the exact same direction, that's not a scientific issue. That's a scientific slam dunk. Now, we can argue, there's lots of great scientific discussions around climate. You can talk about the rate, the role of water vapor, feedback loops, great scientific questions that we can and should be, should be asking. But the weather or not? <laughs> no, no, that's, that's a, so what this comes down to is, is about what's the end there for? If this is happening, what's the end there for? So, uh, it, it's, uh, there's a great study um, by a colleague of mine, Kahane, at, uh, at Yale University, that says if you ask people to I identify uh, themselves in, in terms of you know, philosophies and just various backgrounds, 
and then you present them with the same set of data, they will come to different conclusions. Same set of scientific data. They will come to different conclusions based on how they self-identified. <coughs> that makes a scientist's head explode because we've been saying, oh, if they only understood. No, no, no. It's not about understanding. It's what you're, what you're willing to, to accept and what's the, the end there for. There's this great New Yorker cartoon, and then I'll stop talking, but uh, there's this great New Yorker cartoon of a speaker who obviously has just completed his, his talk and has a bullet point list of, you know, uh, clean jobs, healthier habitat, you know, things like uh, a, a big long list. And the person stands up in the audience and says, yeah, but what, the, what if this climate change stuff is all a big hoax and all we have is a better world? <laughs> so you start saying, what's <laughs> Well, so, so why would you argue against these things? Comes back to the winners and losers economically of the uh, immediate term. And the, the last thing I'll close with is, uh, I, I love the way you phrased it, that the only beneficiaries uh, will be grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and, and you put it in those terms. Are we willing to, uh, willing to give up for the benefits of uh, children and great-grandchildren? But the flip side is also true. Are you willing to take are you willing to be so selfish <laughs> as to have the only victims be your children, 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 grandchildren, grandchildren great-grandchildren? Is, really, is that really who we want to be? Yeah. I think realizing the economic side is one thing, but I still think as, as a scientist there's something we can do, and I think about the examples in environmental health where most of where these issues come about, it, they're public driven. And so I think as a scientist, one other way that we can go, go about it is just making sure that when we're working with the public, of making sure that we're working together with them. And there's a lot of cases, unfortunately, of scientists going in and the environmental health area going in and, and doing types of studies and really kind of taking advantage of those public or the communities that were there and then just leaving and this leaving out. And there's this big push now, and it has been for the past few years, of it, you know, this isn't the right way to do it. This isn't how we build public trust in things that we're doing. And so I think if we always remember when we're going in and we're, we're asking these types of questions and we're working with the public and making sure that we're a team um, and trying to get the, the message both ways and listening to what they have questions about and trying to work towards you know those specific questions and not just our end game of what we're trying to do with some some of our studies i think that we'll we'll see that public backing even more <coughs> maybe i'm being more optimistic but I, I just think i've seen that over through like i think about superfund and it's a superfund movement before with the with the epa and really that was a community that got that going it wasn't um it wasn't the economic it wasn't it wasn't any other factors but it was the community members being active about it and, and wanting change for that and i think we've got to just keep working with the public and making them aware of, of these issues and that we're trying to be on the same page with them as much as possible about what's going on, too. Anything to add, Andy? So, so I would say uh, that much of the work that I've done deals, deals with disasters and very personal things, people choosing their plumbing to determine if it's going to be safe. And I've had people preface their conversations with, I made this politically, but I have to make this decision. And uh, in disasters, when the, the water is handed out or people have, uh, you know, a, a, a parent um, is sitting on the floor with their two kids running around asking if their, their kids are going to get cancer, um, drinking the water that the, the city, county, or state told them could be toxic, um, puts everything to perspective. And, and, and um, I've seen a lot of action taken with the political barriers down because people's direct connection to that primal urge to survive. Um, and I think um, if, if we can find a way to link these big wicked problems to people's everyday lives or health or well-being, there would be less likely um, and there would be public support behind it, then it's possible more productive things may rise to the surface faster than they would with the the muddy water and the muck that takes a long time for something to emerge in today's climate. That's excellent. The time has flown by. I want to have all of us thank our panelists. <laughs> and, and thank you, Paul, for, for making the time to come visit us here at Purdue. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.